Mirror of the Sea by Joseph Conrad The Character of the Foe It seems to me that no man born and truthful to himself could declare that he ever saw the sea looking young as the earth looks young in spring. But some of us, regarding the ocean with understanding and affection, have seen it looking old, as if the immemorial ages had been stirred up from the undisturbed bottom of ooze. For it is a gale of wind that makes the sea look old. From a distance of years, looking at the remembered aspects of the storms lived through, it is that impression which disengages itself clearly from the great body of impressions left by many years of intimate contact. If you would know the age of the earth, look upon the sea in a storm, the grayness of the whole immense surface, the wind furrows upon the faces of the waves, the great masses of foam tossed about and waving like matted white locks give to the sea in a gale an appearance of hourly age, lusterless, dull, without gleams, and though it had been created before light itself. Looking back after much love and much trouble, the instinct of primitive man, who seeks to personify the forces of nature for his affection and for his fear, is awakened again in the breast of one civilized beyond the stage even in his infancy. One seems to have known gales as enemies, and even as enemies one embraces them in that affectionate regret which clings to the past. Gales have their personalities, and after all, perhaps it is not strange, for, when all is said and done, they are adversaries whose wiles you must defeat, whose violence you must resist, and yet with whom you must live in the intimacies of nights and days. Here speaks the man of masts and sails, to whom the sea is not a navigable element, but an intimate companion. The length of passages, the growing sense of solitude, the close dependence upon the very forces that, friendly today, without changing their nature, by the mere putting forth of their might, become dangerous tomorrow, make for that sense of fellowship which modern seamen, good men as they are, cannot hope to know. And besides, your modern ship, which is a steamship, makes her passages on other principles than yielding to the weather and humoring the sea. She receives smashing blows, but she advances. It is a slogging fight, and not a scientific campaign. The machinery, the steel, the fire, the steam, have stepped in between the man and the sea. A modern fleet of ships does not so much make use of the sea as exploit a highway. The modern ship is not the sport of the waves, but let us say that each of her voyages is a triumphant progress, and yet it is a question whether it is not a more subtle and more human triumph to be the sport of the waves and yet survive, achieving your end. In his own time, a man is always very modern. Whether the seaman of three hundred years hence will have the faculty of sympathy, it is impossible to say. An incorrigible mankind hardens its heart in the progress of its own perfectibility. How will they feel on seeing the illustrations to the sea novels of our day, or of our yesterday? It is impossible to guess. But the seamen of the last generation, brought into sympathy with the caravels of ancient time by a sailing ship, their linear descendant, cannot look upon those lumbering forms of navigating the naive seas of ancient woodcuts without a feeling of surprise, of affectionate derision, envy, and admiration. For those things whose 
unmanageableness, even when represented on paper, makes one gasp with a sort of amused horror, were manned by men who are his direct professional ancestors. No, the seamen of three hundred years hence will probably be neither touched nor moved to derision, affection, or admiration. They will glance at the photogravures of our nearly defunct sailing ships with a cold, inquisitive, and indifferent eye. Our ships of yesterday will stand to their ships as no lineal ancestors, but as mere predecessors whose course will have been run and the race extinct. Whatever craft he handles with skill, the seamen of the future shall be not our descendant, but only our successor. And so much depends upon the craft which, made by man, is one with man, and the sea shall wear for him another aspect. I remember once seeing the commander, officially the master, by courtesy the captain, of a fine iron ship of the old wool fleet shaking his head at a very pretty brigantine. She was bound the other way. She was a taut, trim, neat little craft, extremely well kept, and on that serene evening when we passed her close she looked the embodiment of coquettish comfort on the sea. It was somewhere near the Cape, the Cape being, of course, the Cape of Good Hope, the Cape of Storms, of its Portuguese discoverer. And whether it is that the word storm should not be pronounced upon the sea where the storms dwell thickly, or because men are shy of confessing their good hopes, it has become the nameless cape, the Cape Tout Court. The other great cape of the world, strangely enough, is seldom, if ever, called a cape. We say a voyage round the horn. We rounded the horn. We got a frightful battering off the horn, but rarely Cape Horn. And indeed, with some reason, for Cape Horn is as much an island as a cape. The third stormy cape of the world, which is the Leowin, receives generally its full name, as if to console its second-rate dignity. These are the capes that look upon the gales. The little brigantine, then, had doubled the cape. Perhaps she was coming from Port Elizabeth, from East London. Who knows? It was many years ago, but I remember well the captain of the wool clipper nodding at her with the words, fancy having to go about the sea in a thing like that. He was a man brought up in big, deep water ships, and the size of the craft under his feet was part of his conception of the sea. His own ship was certainly big as ships went then. He may have thought of the size of his cabin, or unconsciously, perhaps, have conjured up a vision of a vessel so small tossing amongst the great seas. I didn't inquire, and to a young second mate, the captain of the little pretty Burgantine, sitting astride a camp stool with his chin resting on his hands that were crossed upon the rail, might have appeared a minor king amongst men. We passed her within earshot, without a hail, reading each other's names with the naked eye. Some years later, the second mate, the recipient of that almost involuntary mutter, could have told his captain that a man brought up in the big ships may yet take a peculiar delight in what we should both then have called a small craft. Probably the captain of the big ship would not have understood very well. His answer would have been a gruff, give me size. As I heard another man reply to a remark praising the handiness of a small vessel. It was not a love of the grandiose or the prestige attached to the command of a great tonnage, for he continued with an air of disgust and contempt, why you get flung out of your bunk as likely as not in any sort of heavy weather. I don't know. I remember a few nights in my lifetime, and in a big ship too, as big as they made them then, 
when one did not get flung out of one's bed simply because one never even attempted to get in. One had been made too weary, too hopeless to try. The expedient of turning your bedding out onto a damp floor and, and lying on it there was no earthly good. And since you could not keep your place or get a second's rest in that or any other position, but of the delight of seeing a small craft run bravely amongst the great seas, there can be no question to him whose soul does not dwell ashore. Thus I well remember a three days run got out of a little bark of four hundred tons somewhere between the islands of St. Paul and Amsterdam and Cape Otway on the Australian coast. It was a hard, long gale, gray clouds and green sea. Heavy weather, undoubtedly, but still what a sailor would call manageable. Under two lower topsails and a reefed foresail, the bark seemed to race with a long, steady sea that did not becalm her in the troughs. The solemn thundering combers caught her up from a stern, passed her with a fierce boiling up of foam level with the bulwarks, swept on ahead with a swish and a roar, and the little vessel, dipping her jib-boom into the tumbling froth, would go on running in a smooth, glassy hollow, a deep valley between two ridges of the sea, hiding the horizon ahead and astern. There was such fascination in her pluck, nimbleness, the continual exhibition of unfailing seaworthiness, and the semblance of courage and endurance, that I could not give up the delight of watching her run through three unforgettable days of that gale, which my mate also delighted to extol as a famous shove. And this is one of those gales whose memory in after years returns welcome in dignified austerity, as you would remember with pleasure the noble features of a stranger with whom you crossed swords once in a nightly encounter, and are never to see again. In this way, gales have their physiognomy. You remember them by your own feelings, and no two gales stamp themselves in the same way upon your emotions. Some cling to you in woe-begone misery. Others come back fiercely and weirdly, like ghouls bent upon sucking your strength away. Others, again, have a catastrophic splendor. Some are unvenerated recollections as of spiteful wildcats clawing at your agonized vitals. Others are severe, like a visitation, and one or two rise up draped and mysterious, with an aspect of ominous menace. In each of them there is a characteristic point at which the whole feeling seems contained in one single moment. Thus there is a certain four o'clock in the morning, in the confused roar of a black and white world, when coming on deck to take charge of my watch I received the instantaneous impression that the ship could not live for another hour in such a raging sea. I wonder what became of the men who silently, you couldn't hear yourself speak, must have shared that conviction with me. To be left to write about it is not, perhaps, the most enviable fate, but the point is that this impression resumes, in its intensity, the whole recollection of days and days of desperately dangerous weather. We were then, for reasons which it is not worth while to specify, in the close neighborhood of Kerguelen Island. And now, when I open an atlas and look at the tiny dots on the map of the Southern Ocean, I see as if engraved upon the paper the enraged physiognomy of that gale. Another, strangely, recalls a silent man, and yet it was not din that was wanting. In fact, it was terrific. That one was a gale that came upon the ship swiftly, like a parnpero, which last is a very sudden wind indeed. 
Before we knew very well what was coming, all the sails we had set had burst. The furled ones were blowing loose, ropes flying, sea hissing. It hissed tremendously, wind howling and the ship lying on her side, so that half of the crew were swimming and the other half clawing desperately at whatever came to hand. According to the side of the deck each man had been caught on by the catastrophe, either to leeward or to windward. The shouting I need not mention, it was the merest drop in an ocean of noise, and yet the character of the gale seems contained in the recollection of one small, not particularly impressive, sallow man without a cap and with a very still face. Captain Jones, let us call him Jones, had been caught unawares. Two orders he had given at the first sign of an utterly unforeseen onset. After that, the magnitude of his mistake seemed to have overwhelmed him. We were doing what was needed and feasible. The ship behaved well. Of course, it was some time before we could pause in our fierce and laborious exertions. But all through the work, the excitement, the uproar, and some dismay, we were aware of this silent little man at the break of the poop, perfectly motionless, soundless, and often hidden from us by the drift of sprays. When we officers clambered at last upon the poop, he seemed to come out of that numbed composure and shouted to us downwind, Try the pumps. Afterwards he disappeared. As to the ship, I need not say that Although she was presently swallowed up in one of the blackest nights I can remember, she did not disappear. In truth, I don't fancy that there had ever been much danger of that. But certainly the experience was noisy and particularly distracting, and yet it is the memory of a very quiet silence that survives. For after all, a gale of wind, the thing of mighty sound, is inarticulate. It is man who, in a chance phrase, interprets the elemental passion of his enemy. Thus there is another gale in my memory, a thing of endless, deep, humming roar and moonlight and a spoken sentence. It was off the other cape, which is always deprived of its title as the Cape of Good Hope is robbed of its name. It was off the horn, for a true expression of disheveled wildness, there is nothing like a gale and the bright moonlight of a high latitude. The ship, brought to and bowing to enormous flashing seas, glistened wet from deck to trucks. Her one set sail stood out a coal black shape upon the gloomy blueness of the air. I was a youngster then, and suffering from weariness, cold, and imperfect oilskins, which let water in at every seam. I craved human companionship, and coming off the poop, took my place by the side of the boatswain, a man whom I did not like, in a comparatively dry spot, where at worst we had water only up to our knees. Above our heads the explosive booming gusts of wind pass continuously, justifying the sailor's saying, it blows great guns. And just from that need of human companionship, being very close to the man, I said, or rather shouted, blows very hard, boatswain. His answer was, hey, and if it blows only a little harder, things will begin to go. I don't mind as long as everything holds, but when things begin to go, it's bad. The note of dread in the shouting voice, the particular truth of these words, heard years ago from a man I did not like, have stamped its peculiar character on that gale. A look in the eyes of a shipmate, a low murmur in the most sheltered spot where the watch on duty are huddled together, a meaning moan from one to the other, with a glance at the windward sky, a sigh of weariness, a gesture of disgust, passing into the keeping of the great wind, become part and parcel of the gale, the olive hue 
of hurricane clouds presents an aspect peculiarly appalling, the inky, ragged rack flying before a nor'west wind makes you dizzy with its headlong speed that depicts the rush of the invisible air. A hard sou'wester startles you with its close horizon and its low gray sky, as if the world were a dungeon wherein there is no rest for body or soul. And there are black squalls, white squalls, thunder squalls, and unexpected gusts that come without a single sign in the sky, and of each kind no one of them resembles another. There is infinite variety in the gales of wind at sea, and except for the peculiar, terrible, and mysterious moaning that may be heard sometimes passing through the roar of a hurricane, except for that unforgettable sound, as if the soul of the universe had been goaded into a mournful groan, it is, after all, the human voice that stamps the mark of human consciousness upon the character of a gale.